Good morning, saints. How are you today? Cold? Yes, but being warmed, right, by us being together, I hope. Um, it is good to have you in worship. It is a beautiful, wonderful thing to see each of your smiling faces uh, again on this uh, very chilly morning, but the sun is out and God is here and God is with us and uh, that is the most important thing. Amen? Amen. Uh, my name is Patty Hewitt. I'm the lead pastor here at Blackwater and so we welcome you who are joining us via Facebook. Uh, we are glad that you are here. If you have any questions about our life together, please uh, make a comment, leave a comment there in that thread, and we will answer those as best as we can. But we hope that you also feel the love of God wherever you are uh, today. So now, would you join me, please, in a word of prayer as we open this time together. Gracious Lord, we come before you. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to widen our heart's capacity to know who you are, to know better and better your will and your way. Lord, we ask that as we sing and as we pray, as we listen and as we ponder, that the fullness of who you are, who we know in Jesus, Lord, would become as real as the very next breath that we take. Lord, thank you for, for inviting us here to share this time of worship and praise together. May it be pleasing to you. May it rise to your throne, Lord, and may uh, by us being here that we are all blessed. We ask and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So I hope uh, that you picked up your white bag, that you um, have already filled out or will fill out that Connect card that lets us know of your attendance, that you were here today with us. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with that card, on the reverse side, there's a place that you can put any prayer requests that you have. So uh, we hope that you will do that. And then you can deposit those in one of three baskets here in the front, uh, two in the back. And you can also make um, any offering that you might have today, your tithe, your offering. Uh, to the work of Christ here in this community. So uh, drop all those in the basket. We will make sure that those get to the right place. I really only have a couple of things uh, as we share our life together. I know uh, Reverend Angie had lifted up last week in my absence uh, to be on the lookout for some new group experiences that would be uh, available to you uh, come next month, probably. We're going to um, advertise those in the February uh, newsletter, and then they'll be online and everything. But I hope that you will keep a sharp eye for that. There's going to be some Bible studies and a couple of financial peace um, invitations that you can be a part of, a, a few different things. And so um, we hope that you will uh, come alongside and that you will experience these in community with one another. And if you have an idea for a small group or a class or something, please come and talk to Reverend Angie and myself about that because we want to add um, things that are relevant to our life together and things that help us grow in Christ. Um, and tomorrow, at, in observance of Martin Luther King holiday, uh, we will be closed. Uh, the PDO is closed and the church office is closed, so if you need to get in touch with us, uh, we won't be back here until Wednesday, but many of you know how to get in touch with uh, Reverend Angie and myself if something in an emergency fashion would, uh, would come up. Um, but again, we are glad that you are here. We feel very blessed that you are feel. I know I feel very blessed to be uh, back here with you. And so with that, I'm going to ask you to stand and greet one another by your waves and by your smiles and make sure that you look up to that camera and greet those who are worshiping with us online. And now let us remain standing as we say together what we believe through the Apostles' Creed. The words will be on the screen before you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. 
from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated. invite us to live together in a community. Thank you for this gift of gathering with one another as we seek to posture our whole selves toward you. In that posturing, we also acknowledge this morning our own resistance, resistance to you and to our neighbor. Follow me seems such a simple request, but yet we find ourselves frequently wandering. Forgive us for our wandering, Lord. Forgive us for our comfortable lives while others live in poverty. Forgive us for our resentment towards our brothers and sisters who live differently than us, love differently, differently than us, and who believe differently than us. Help us to love others as abundantly as you do. But God, you know our hearts you know where we are most resistant, most resentful, most unforgiving. So this morning we ask you to sharpen our minds to your understanding of the world. Soften our souls to the cries of your people and strengthen our spirits for the work you would have us do in the world. And when we find ourselves in moments where we can't find that feeling, your presence, when we're searching for you, God, when we are finding ourselves alone or perhaps without the words to cry out. I ask that as we pray this morning, as we lift our voices with the Lord's Prayer, that you remind us of the body that you have surrounded us with. We say it together this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
know, through the years of, of pastoring, and y'all probably heard this before too, you know, that you've got, um, and some of you might feel this way too, so this is not like a judgment, but, um, you know, people shouldn't applaud in church. You know, we should not applaud for anybody but God, you know, and, and again, some of you might feel like that, but, you know, I feel like that when, when we show our thanksgiving in a demonstrative way, um, maybe not every time, but the time that we feel moved, when we hear the beautiful voice of Jamie just lifting up, God's praises, when we hear the giftedness of Dr. West, you know, it is a praise to God. It is remembering um, his gifts that have been laid upon these people. And so I am all for showing the love to both of y'all. So thank you so much um, for what you do and who you are. Uh, so I want to ask you, uh, this is going to be what you're about to see is from, from almost 50, I can't believe it, years ago. And I want to see if you remember this commercial. Mm. Peanut butter. Mmm, chocolate. <laughs> you got peanut butter in my chocolate. Well, you got chocolate in my peanut butter. Bravissimo. Two yeah. great tastes that taste great together. Reese's peanut butter cup. Real milk chocolate. Good old-fashioned peanut butter. Reese's peanut butter cup. Who remembers that commercial? I know, I don't want to hear from you or you or even you back there in the back. I don't want to hear from y'all that don't remember that, okay? Because we, the elders of the church, right, remember that commercial, right? In 1970, no, 1917, excuse me, Harry Reese um, saw this advertisement uh, to go to work in a, uh, in a dairy, a farmland dairy that was owned by none other than Milton Hershey, owner of Hershey's Chocolate Cup Company, right? He worked on that farm for several years, and he kept learning how they did things and learning the business of dairy work. And then they moved him over to the chocolate factory side, and he learned more and more about that, kept being filled with more and more knowledge until one day he said, you know, I could do this. I could do this. I could have my own company. And so from his basement, he started making, a, 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 of course, a lot of different kinds of candy, but especially this, what he called then, two names uh, were applied to this candy. One was peanut butter cups, but the other ones were called penny cups because each of those round confections cost a penny, right? And he would do that. And as we say, the rest is history, right? That he would do it. He would not come to the full reality of this, uh, if you want to say calling or this occupation or this endearment that he had with making this, you know, confections uh, for the world. Um, but it would not happen overnight. It would happen little by little as he gained more knowledge and as he gained uh, more confidence about how to go out and do that work in the world. And so you might be thinking, what in the world has that got to do with uh, God and with our relationship with Christ? Well, today in our story from the first chapter of John, I believe it does tell us uh, something about two very unique and significant um, things that are going to come together um, to really not just change lives, but really to, ch to be the, the launching platform of what would change the world. Two things coming together to make an incredible difference in the world. And again, like Mr. Reese, it's not going to happen overnight, but it will come to completion. So let's read our text for this morning again. This is the first chapter of John, starting with the 43rd verse. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. 
When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are king of Israel. And Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this is one of the call stories, what's called the call stories in the Gospels. And all the Gospels have a, a variation of some of these calls that, um, that the disciples heard the voice of Jesus or saw Jesus, some kind of way encountered Jesus, and they began following as disciples. And while um, this story might look like it focuses on Philip and Nathaniel, really the focus is on Jesus. The focus is on Jesus and how he is revealed and what he reveals to both of these really green followers of his uh, from these very beginning stages. Jesus is revealing to them who he is and what he came into the world to be and to do and to accomplish. So the first of the two strands, I told you before that this story had two specific things coming together. The first of those strands that John writes about is divine revelation. Divine revelation. And when we talk about revelation as believers um, in the church, you know, divine meaning of God, right? Something beyond humanity. But revelation, think about it like this. It's like a veil, in a sense, being lifted off of something that is very sacred to where we will be able to see it for what it is. So a lot of times uh, people will look at Revelation and wonder, okay, now I know that's a book of the Bible, but what does it really mean? So think about it like that. It's, it's like God taking off a veil, off of, of something or someone, very sacred learning that he's allowing us to peer at, to gaze at, to finally lay our eyes upon. In this text, Jesus says very little about himself, if, if really he says anything at all, which I think is remarkable. He doesn't say, here I am, I'm the king of Israel. He doesn't say, here I am, I am the Messiah. He will say things like that. But in this story, he does not. This is the very beginning of his ministry. And he does not say um, anything to them about this. But yet, they bestow upon him titles. And so we hear Philip and Nathaniel say say this and call him this, Rabbi, Son of God, and the King of Israel. How is that? When Jesus has not said that himself, how do they know that? It is by revelation. It is by divine revelation. And if we were to look back at the chapter previous, not the chapter, but the verses previous to these verses, we would find others that would call him the Lamb of God. They would call him the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit or Messiah. All these titles give us a glimpse into who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do and what Jesus came to bring and how his life will make so much sense as it relates to changing our lives and changing the world. So titles that are confessed about Jesus, and we call, um, when these men say, you are the King of Israel, you are the Messiah, you are the Lamb of God, they're making confession of that. That's what the church uses to say, we are putting that title upon you, and these titles are important. They were important then and they are, are important now because what they t tell us and give us a glimpse of is who God is and God's will and God's way, what God's nature is, what his character is. 
these titles mean something. And what's amazing is that, again, Jesus here does not uh, put these titles upon himself. Rather, they are revealed to these new followers. They are revealed by the hand of God. And again, if you think about that image of a veil, just think about God just pulling that veil just a little bit more so you can see a little bit more about who this person is that they are encountering. And the reason why they are, they are seeing this, the reason why they are receiving the revelation is because they have this encounter with the Son of God, right? With God himself, God with skin on. That's why they can see who he is. So we read in Hebrews these words, Jesus Christ is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. When we see Jesus, we see God. And then John 14, Jesus says this, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. They are looking into the eyes of God incarnate, and God is allowing them to see who he is, this di divine revelation. And we all have it, whether we know it or not. We all receive this gift, whether we know it or not, from time to time. And especially, I think, as we seek after it. So I know... and. I'm going to try to say this in a way that, that you're not like, what? So when I first fell in love with Jesus, I knew him as Savior. First and foremost, that's what was revealed to me, or, or at least what my heart was opened toward, is you are my Savior. I knew of his uh, uh, forgiveness. I knew of God's grace. I knew of some restoration that was going on in my life. You know, I, I saw myself as that sinner, but being made into a saint. Gee, I'm about to start coughing if you're wondering why I'm swallowing so much. Would you mind getting me some water? <coughs> I'm sorry. Allergy time. Um, but that that's, that's was my relationship with the living God, was his Savior. But over time, what was revealed to me, among other things, was, wait a minute. Jesus isn't just a savior, not my savior. Jesus is also my Lord. And what does that mean? You know, I, I came to a place and I'm still coming to that place that I'm understanding that I need to submit myself to the command and the, and the, the words and the teaching and the work of Jesus Christ in my life. Like I need to be the one to acquiesce that when Jesus says something, I obey, that I uh, comply with that. So I give it all to God that he has allowed me to see God, Jesus my Savior, Jesus as my Lord, and then the, of course, uh, those other titles, some of those, um, which I've gotten that glimpse of too. But I can tell you the most profound one is to recognize and have that epiphany. We're still in a season of epiphany to recognize and realize that, you know, Jesus is not only Savior, but he is King and he is Lord. And what a glorious revelation that that is. What I love about this story, about Philip and Nathaniel, that uh, they received this revelation while they, while they just said, yes, I'll follow you. And they would continue to receive revelation as they followed along with Jesus, as they went with him hand in hand, as they listened to his teachings, as they would do what he would tell them to do, not always perfect, sometimes backsliding, but still they learned and they received this revelation as they walked along that path with and for Jesus. I think that is amazing that God does not wait for us uh, to see the fullness of who he is, because I don't know that God, um, I don't know that 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 could happen. I don't know that we would be able to take and to really receive all that God is if we weren't on that path. And that leads us to the next strand. And that strand is discipleship. That is the next strand that is woven into this divine revelation that God is giving and wants to give into our lives. Throughout the journey, 
throughout their journey here and our journey with Jesus, uh, the Lord uh, gives us what we can handle at any given time. The Lord reveals to us that what he wants to reveal when, when we are at a, a place that we can either receive it, that we are open to just that crack in the door, that we can begin to understand it and live into it, even though we may not be there fully, right? Take Philip, for example. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida. This is going back to the scripture, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, listen to what Philip says, the first things he says <clears throat> about Jesus. He says, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. There is no king, there is no uh, Lord, there's none of those confessions. He simply recognizes that Jesus sure looks like this one that we have been studying all of our lives. They would have studied the, the scriptures of that day. And he recognizes that this is the one. This is the one to whom the scriptures point to, that the prophets talked about. That's right then, in that moment of time, that is th the best and the fullest that he can do, which is great because he's moving toward bigger and greater and deeper understandings of God. And then he also says, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. So these two things are the things that he can say concretely about this man, this person that is standing before him, right? It's going to take time. It's going to take walking in this way of discipleship for him to discover more and more about who God is. And going back to that Reese commercial, right? It usually doesn't happen overnight. It's usually a progression. So the way that we have more and more revelation um, is by walking hand in hand with Jesus and in community with one another. So let's look at Nathaniel, okay? Nathaniel is not one of these sinners turned saint. He's not w one like that. Um, Jesus has not called this particular person because he's a sinner, um, Jesus calls him because he can see in Nathaniel something that I think is hard for Nathaniel to even see himself. Jesus uh, says that he has no deceit in him. He has no deception in him. Jesus can see into the heart of Nathaniel and knows that, that he is going to be a wonderful follower um, of his as they go through these days and the next three years that they will spend together. And if you remember, Jesus says this, he assures Nathaniel will see greater things. Remember in the scripture, he said, you are going to see greater things. You thought this was good? You thought just because I saw you under the fig tree um, that I know you? Oh, you are going to see greater things. Now, while that can mean... <clears throat> A whole lot of different things. I think what he might be telling Nathaniel is, your faith is going to continue to come alive. You are going to be shown more and more revelation as we go along this journey together. God is going to continue to, to remove that veil a little bit at a time to show you his glory, to show you his way, to show you his love, to show you his discipline, to show you all the things that you need to build a solid life with God. I think that's what maybe he was telling Nathaniel. The practice of discipleship will aid Philip and Nathaniel, right? It will help them to more fully open their hearts and their minds to what God is doing in the world, uh, what Jesus is there to bring into their lives. Um, a, a path of discipleship, and, and most of us, I would think, would know something about what that is. In our discipleship, that, that includes a whole lot of things. Uh, of course, it includes prayer. It includes the study of scripture. It includes being together. It includes holding one another accountable. It includes inquiring to each other, how is your life with God? And then helping us to correct places on the journey that we've gotten off the path. Uh, a path of discipleship means that we're going to that we're being uh, more and more generous. We're learning what that means in every single way. 
that we serve, that we sacrifice, all of those things they are going to be doing with Jesus as they follow him. And hence, God will continue to reveal to them more fully who Jesus is. It's this partnership. It's this hand-in-hand uh, walk. It's this, these two strands that come together to make a powerful, powerful change in our lives. This back and forth, this in and out, this under and over will not just change Philip and Nathaniel's life, not just change those other disciples who were called, right? Matthew and Bartholomew and all the other ones, but they change us as well. Divine revelation and discipleship. So did you notice how much finding that there was in this part of the text? If you were to read from pretty much the beginning of 1 John, you would also see that there's a whole lot of finding going on. Jesus finds Philip. Philip finds Nathaniel. Philip then tells Nathaniel that he's found the one, right? And then Nathaniel finds that Jesus knows more about him than he could ever imagine. There's a whole lot of finding going on, which is a good thing, right? And when I look in our world today, there's a lot of finding that needs to continue to happen because this world is lost. Some of us, in, in, even in our um, desire to please and love God, there might be places that you are lost today as well, right? We're not just here to find people out there, but we are also here to allow God to continue to find us, to find us, to show him who he is and to continue to show us that light, show us the way that we are walking more humbly and obediently and steadfastly with Jesus. Right now, some may be still lost in the pandemic. You may be lost in intense division, lost with a resort to violence, lost in a weariness to injustice and bias, and so much more. A good friend of mine uh, who owns a beauty salon, uh, I had a conversation with her not too long ago. She had about eight employees, and it was her shop. She said that seven of them walked out on the same day and left that work, left her business to struggle because she didn't vote the way they voted. Talk about being lost. Talk about being out there just doing the wrong thing for the wrong reason. And I asked her, I said, did y'all have a fight? She said, no. But they, they knew and they all worked together to try to hurt the business. Such lostness, and this lostness is throughout this world. But here's the good news, right? That in this story, Philip and Nathaniel, and then later other disciples that include you and me, we have encountered the one whose job it is to find the lost, right? Again, not just out there, but in here, and really the way we should be working hand in hand with Jesus in here, in our own lives. Jesus finds and welcomes the irresponsible and the self-absorbed, the destructive, the divisive, the liars, those who pass the buck. Jesus finds the prideful and the one that you consider the pain and the rump. Jesus finds people pleasers and the unethical clergy persons. He finds those who, who hold grudges and won't let them go. The mother who has that unbridled temper and the father whose priorities are out of order. That's the good news, is that Jesus has come for us. Jesus has come for those people of which we are apart. And I am grateful. I'm grateful that what's tucked in these passages of the scripture today is that we get a glimpse of, I think we get a revelation of a God who never stops seeking and ne never stops searching, doesn't barge his way in, but simply continues to say, follow me or come and see 
Come and taste that the Lord is good. However you want to say it, that is the kind of God who has given us life. That is the God who continues to be with us and walk with us and will never give up on us. This divine revelation, this discipleship is a braided journey. They go hand in hand, each one of those strands working together for the good of our lives, for the good of this world, and to glorify God in heaven, to glorify our Father in heaven. And so there's, there's two calls that I see here for us today. And if you don't leave here with anything else, I hope you will leave really with these on your heart and in your mind. First, <clears throat> ask for revelation. Ask God to reveal God's own self to you. In however way God wants to do that, whatever timeline that God wants to use for that, ask God. God, you, you remember in the Old Testament of the scripture, we hear that prayer, God, show me your glory. That is a prayer of, please, Lord, give me revelation. Show me yourself. Pull that veil off a little bit more and a little bit more and let me see you. Let me experience you in a whole new, refreshed way. That's one, is to pray for and ask for divine revelation. And we don't ask for that just so we have it. There's always a so that. It's so that when we see God more and more, that we live more like God would have us to live. And that, of course, is to be a person in whom Christ dwells. And then the, the other thing that I would say to pray for is your path of discipleship, your walk of discipleship. Pray that God, if you don't have the want to, pray for the want to. God, I need the want to to make you first priority in my life. God, I need you to, sur to surround me with people who are walking this life who I can bring questions to, and not just questions, but struggles to, that I can confess my sin to, that will help me on the journey. Lord, I need that. Help me, Lord. And again, if you don't have the want to, pray for the want to. Lord, I want, I want to be a faithful disciple. And again, not period, I just want to be a better disciple. It, there's a so that there too. So that, Lord, you will reveal to me more and more of who you are. Again, it's this back and forth and over and under and in and out um, of a gift that God wants so desperately to give to you and to me and to all who will follow in his name. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God extends this beautiful, glorious invitation. And so I read those words. From Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Call to me, God said, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things, fenced in and hidden, which you do not know. Praise be to God. Glory to be to God in the highest. Let us pray. Lord, so often your people don't ask, don't pray for what you want to give to us. And yet, Lord, you still give, you still unveil, you still show us revelation. But Lord, how much sweeter and deeper and wider would that be if we sincerely ask for that? if we would pray for that, if we would yearn for that. Lord, today your people want to see you, want to see you fully for who you are. So God, we ask as a community of faith to show us, give us a revelation. Lord, we ask that that veil um, that that is not keeping things completely in the dark, but yet hidden enough that, that we can't see the fullness of who you are. 
We ask that you would remove that, God, so that we would come to call you king with a, with a fierce confession, that we would call you savior with everything in us, that we'd know, that we would know that you are the Messiah of the world, Lord, because once we see it, we can't unsee it. So, Lord, give us a revelation. And, Lord, I ask for myself and for my brothers and sisters, God, that you would help to strengthen our discipleship, that you would help us to walk faithfully with you, and that you would help us to, to lay down all the things that we put that are stumbling blocks, Lord, in, in, in really having that, that full and lively, beautiful relationship with you. Lord, put people in our lives that will help us grow. Give us faith, Lord, to, to, to know and to see next steps on this path, Lord. This and so much more we lift to you this morning in the name of Christ our Lord. And the people of God said, amen, amen. So as we prepare to uh, leave this place having shared together, um, our closing hymn is going to be one that I hope is familiar to you. If not, you're going to learn a beautiful hymn that fits so perfectly uh, with uh, this scripture and with this theme. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. So please stand. Uh, remember, you are welcome to sing. Uh, if you do that, please put your mask back on and sing softly as Jesus calls to you softly.
to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Go in peace. Sin no more. Love God and serve God's people. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.